Welcome back to the Mackinac Policy Conference. I'm Christy McDonald. Uh, we're part of Detroit Public Television's coverage all week of the conference. It is just day one, and joining me right now is Senator Gary Peters. Senator Peters, it's always good to see you up here on Mackinac. Great to be with you as well. All right, and what I always enjoy most is watching people interact in the room and yep. come in and out of the parlor where we are right now. And it, and it always strikes me, it's interesting to know what people are stopping you and talking to you most about here at Mackinac. Well, actually, right here, uh, you know, I've been real involved in with self-driving cars mobility, and that's what the main focus of a lot of what's happening here. I'll be on a panel shortly, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm uh, I have legislation in the Senate, the AV Start Act, which is passed out of Senate committee, and all the folks related to the auto industry, and there are a lot of them here, uh, want to know what's going on with that bill. When can we see it? Because uh, it's important to get that out so that there's a, a framework where they understand where the regulatory. Uh, kind of framework will be for them as they put these cars out onto public highways. You know, and when we look into the future like that and being able to set up those regulations and those policies, has Michigan really put, have we really put ourselves in the best position to be the leader across the country in this? We are, there's no question uh, Michigan uh, is a leader. We've got to continue to be focused on that. There's a lot of other folks that want to do it. Uh, and self-driving cars uh, is not just about automobiles. It's really about the machine learning and the artificial intelligence necessary to process the massive amount of information that those vehicles take in and then drive safely through a complex city environment. So we have competition from folks in Silicon Valley, obviously, mm -hmm. but in uh, Austin and Pittsburgh. And Colorado. And, uh, they want Colorado as well. They want to get in on it as well. I in guess Colorado, right, yeah, yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. And we have Arizona test tracks. And so, uh, and the thing that's important and why it's just critically important for us here in Michigan is that uh, because of the AI and machine learning, that means you'll be the center not just for autos, but for artificial intelligence, which is without question the next big thing that'll transform every industry. It's going to transform everything about it. Uh, I'm also uh, working with the Department of Defense. I serve on the Armed Services Committee in Washington. We have TARDEC, which does advanced research for the U.S. Army. And when you think of autonomy, it'll change warfare in ways that we can't fully appreciate right now as well. And we can be the center for the defense industry as well. So this has very big ramifications for the future. And those are the kinds of things that uh, folks are talking to me about and, mm -hmm. and how are we positioned uh, to make sure that we can uh, take advantage of it because there, there will be winners and losers in terms of regions of the country just as there will be countries. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at that because when it has come to winners and losers and being high on a list of winners, Michigan hasn't been very high on the list when you look at what happened with Amazon, not even making the finals. And when you look at when the Army's looking at relocating, you know, you're still having conversations, but Detroit wasn't even cracking that top 10 list. What is the perception of Michigan right now when it comes to large relocations of business? And what can we do to change maybe that perception that we are a place that businesses should be able to invest? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, you mentioned the Futures Command for the Army, something I was very uh, involved in. And it was frustrating that we didn't make the uh, top 15 list. We were in the top 20 uh, areas Michigan was looked at. And what was particularly frustrating is that Secretary Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, was at the Army conference uh, earlier this year, and he highlighted four areas where there's incredible innovation occurring. He mentioned Austin, Texas. He mentioned Silicon Valley, Boston, and Michigan. So here you have the Secretary of Defense saying Michigan is one of the top four, and yet we didn't make the list of 15. You know, I pushed very hard with the Secretary of Defense as to how did that happen. And they were looking at four criteria. They were looking at talent. We actually ranked very high. They were looking at uh, STEM education and research, very high, as well as our universities, very high. And if you look at it, we were really in the top five or six. What knocked us out of competition? They used a livability index, uh, AARP livability index, which looks at health and transportation and civic engagement and all of those kinds of issues, and we were not competitive with most major metropolitan areas. To me, that's a wake-up call. So when you come to a conference like this and you've got business leaders in this state, you have politicians here, you have foundation heads, and you say, look, this is what this is what happened, and this is what they showed me about the criteria, why we're not making right. these top 10 lists. Where do we start in terms of trying to change and, and trying to change the needle on this? Well, I think where you start is you realize it's really very holistic. You've got to be looking at all of government, all of, all of society, business coming together. So when it looks at health outcomes, one thing they look at is uh, how many people have access to, to health care. We rank very low in that. And you say, well, what does healthcare have to do with attracting talent? It means a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And we got to realize that these are all interrelated. The other area is air quality. Uh, we did very poorly on that score, which is part of the livability index as to where you want to bring your family. We know we often have uh, problems with air quality in Southeast Michigan, for example. So dealing with air quality is actually incredibly important to being a center for innovation. 
people sometimes think those are two separate things. They're not. When we look at the leadership structure, though, because it's going to take leadership, and we have a bit of a shift now. We have a governor's race that's uh, that's happening, and there is going to be a change in leadership. Do we have the kind of political will to be able to gather the correct people in place to say, now we need to tackle some of these problems, and we have to invest in fixing some of these problems? Well, we have to have the political will, and we have to be looking at this not in a in such a partisan lens. You know, I've always thought you best ideas come together when you work together and try to find a bipartisan path to do that. It's going to be hard because our country is becoming more and more polarized, which I'm very concerned about. But with, that's the only way you're going to solve uh, these issues is uh, to do that. So that political will has to be there. But uh, the folks of, of, of Michigan have to understand we've got to come together as well. And, and that means stepping up and spending some money to invest, to your point. You, infrastructure, for example. You've got to have world-class roads and world-class infrastructure to attract the kind of talent and innovation that will look for things like that as to where they're going to locate. You know, when you think about uh, Amazon not coming here and uh, now the Army's modern, uh, modernization uh, command, I mean, they're getting inputs from McKinsey and other kinds of consulting firms. They're not just consulting the Army, for example. They're consulting other, other places. And folks are going to look at places uh, that are, are there from a livability perspective, not just from an engineering perspective. So you talked about bipartisanship, and that's um, something that people don't really believe exists in Washington right now, in the climate in Washington. How would you describe um, the climate in Washington right now? Well, it's a challenge. I mean, we have a challenge uh, to do that. I want to I want to have be optimistic that we there is more bipartisanship than sometimes uh, gets portrayed out there. You know, I, the AV Start Act, for example, that I'm working on for the auto industry with the auto industry. I'm working with the chair of the committee, Republican, Senator Thune from South Dakota. We have an incredible working relationship. We've been working together intensely over the last few months. We're going to get this through. I've, I work with other members. So there are pockets where that happens. On some of the big issues, unfortunately, we're still not there yet. Mm -hmm. But you hope that you build a track record of building relationships on some of the other issues that will then transcend. But it's also ultimately up to the American people to say that they want folks to go to Washington that are going to find common ground instead of uh, saying, if you're working with the other side, you're doing something wrong. That, exactly. That, that's and not the way this country was designed. I know, but how do we change that? How do we change that thought and philosophy that I feel that we've gotten to this point where it's so polarized that if you do work with someone else, you're doing the wrong thing, that you're not sticking to what your base says you should do or for what your side says you're supposed yeah. to do? Well, I, I think you got to demonstrate that you can work together and do it in a positive way. But you're going to take some grief doing it. I, I get grief if, if when I sometimes work with my Republican colleagues on certain issues. And whenever you work with somebody on the other side, that doesn't mean you get everything that you'd like. They don't get everything they'd like either, and some people don't like that. But it's up to us to show that here's a demonstrated accomplishment that people will appreciate, and then hopefully that will start changing the dialogue. Um, two things I want to get caught up on and just where we are. I know you said on some of the big issues, we're still very far away when, and in Washington. Talk to me a little bit about immigration reform. Uh, this is kind of bubbled back up again and looking at unaccompanied minors at the border. Um, we still don't have any solution for dreamers right now. Where are we with those conversations? We're, we're not where we should be. Uh, we have to deal with the immigration issue and, and understand that that's uh, uh, an issue that's always uh, made our country great. Now, certainly we have to have secure borders, there's no question. First and foremost, I serve on the Homeland Security Committee, so we want to make sure that we can uh, prevent folks from coming across to, that are not doing it in a, in a legal fashion. But on the other hand, uh, we do need to attract the best and brightest to our country. That's the way this country has always been great. You know, here we are sitting at, uh, in Mackinac Island. Uh, there's been a big issue with folks, uh, whether or not they can have people come in here temporarily to, to work mm -hmm. in places here in Mackinac Island. Uh, and they try to recruit folks from other places in Michigan, but they can't get all of their folks. They need temporary people to come in here, and then they go back home afterwards. And when they don't get that, you see actually businesses shut down here in Mackinac Island. You're seeing it in Traverse City. You're seeing it uh, throughout our agricultural sector. Michigan mm -hmm. is an incredibly powerful agricultural state, the most diverse agricultural products of any state except California. And if they don't have workers, uh, our economy is actually hurt. But unfortunately, we were letting ideology uh, get in the way of practical, common sense kinds of business decisions. And that means having an immigration policy that works for everybody. And one final thing, let me ask you, after Parkland, after the shooting in Parkland, I thought that there was some kind of traction in Washington. There was a bipartisan work group in the House taking a look at maybe some kind of common sense reform, gun, uh, gun control reform. Where are we there? Well, it's, uh, we've made baby steps, unfortunately, uh, is all we've had after that shooting. We, we passed a... Uh, Omnibus bill that had some things dealing with background checks. The, the, it's called the, the 
the next system and there were some flaws so that's been fixed but still that's not enough to have a good database if you don't actually use it and in this country still 40 percent of all gun sales are done without any kind of background check you know, that's something common sense vast majority of the american people support 80 plus percent and yet we aren't there yet we just want to get it on the floor and get a vote we haven't been able to get that through the Republican Congress yet. All right. Well, we're, uh, we'll continue to watch that. Senator Gary Peters, thanks so much for joining me. It's always good to see you and uh, enjoy you. the rest of the conference. Thank All you right, so we'll much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye -bye.